told Gina before I walked out, don't panic, I'm going to go around the side to get the podium. <laughs> she would have gotten real nervous if I would have uh, not said anything. <sighs> Welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning and to worship with you, to sing praises to God and to pray unto Him. We're thankful for our visitors and, your, uh, and the opportunity for us to meet you and to worship with you. We are very, very grateful for that. If you'd like to follow along with me, I'm going to begin this morning in Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. I'll be saying a few words this morning, and then uh, Brother Chris will be saying a few words after, afterwards, <clears throat> but I'll get us started. Titus chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, it says, But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience. And the older women likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teacher of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works and doctrine showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. Exhort bondservants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, not showing all good fidelity, I mean, but showing all good fidelity. I did that uh, the other night too, sorry. <laughs> um, that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Praise God. We came here a few years back as a family, Gina, Peyton, and I, and when we came to Chelsea, we were looking for something more. What we were looking for is an opportunity for us to grow and develop uh, and to be with those who are like-minded that are trying to grow and develop and do the same thing, things that we were. It was the Lord's body that was zealous for good works that attracted us to coming here. It was like anything we had ever experienced. We've lived in a lot of different states, Texas, Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, and Florida. <laughs> so we've been to a lot of different congregations over the years. Most congregations have two to three, three families that are very active and very strong in the faith. We've seen very strong congregations and they had five or six families that were very active and strong in the faith. When we came here, it was easily in the double digits of families that were active and strong in the faith. That, it just really amazed us. We were so encouraged and uplifted, and we knew at that point that this was the place for us to grow, for us to learn and develop and be more useful for the Lord's uh, service. As in the days of Nehemiah, the people had a mind to work. Everyone here is important and has a way to contribute to the Lord's body. Each of you have an area on the wall. You have an area on the wall to work. You have an area on the wall to help. You have an area on the wall to strengthen and to build. This is the Lord's work. That's what he's called for us to do and to help each other grow. 
the services were and still are uplifting because the ones that participate in it, and whether they're teaching Bible classes, whether they're leading prayers, whether they're giving the Lord's Supper taught, whether they are leading singing, or whether they are proclaiming his message, it doesn't matter. Everyone gives their best. That's what's so unique and encouraging. And it's not, and I, I say all of these things, not to proclaim us as we're great, but God is great. And because people have allowed God to help them, to grow them, to change them, and develop them. Praise God for allowing that to happen. Amen. Where are we now? We've lost our focus a little bit. But the good news is the Lord provides hope. The Lord can lead us back to that picture that I just talked about and better than that. He is capable of everything. Everyone wants that picture, and the Lord wants that picture. That's it. And if, if He wants it and we want it, it'll happen. It can be even better than our past. Who is going to say that the Lord can't? Who's going to say that? Who are we now? This is the body of Christ. We are a people that love the Lord, that love His Word, that love each other, and that love the lost. Again, going back to being in many different congregations, that's rare. That's rare. You can find one or two of those elements. You might be able to find three of those elements in the congregation. Not saying we're perfect. I'm not, I'm not saying that. But we've got a good foundation in Jesus Christ. We've got a good foundation and good hearts among the people. I'm thankful to be a part of it. I'm grateful to be a part of that. Sorry, kind of lost my place here. The Lord has brought us together at this time and this place for a reason, for a purpose. We are here to accomplish His purposes. We are here to glorify Him and to give others hope, the same hope that we have. That's why we are here together. When we began the process of, of uh, deciding that we want to pursue elders, I thought a lot about that, and I prayed a lot about it, and I talked to Gina about it. It scared me. It overwhelmed me. It was because of the magnitude of the weight of the responsibility. I, I just don't know. I, I just don't know. Am I, am I ready? Does the Lord want that for me? And I decided I would put my name forward as someone that was interested in that. And then I prayed again. I prayed, prayed God, just, you know, if, if it's your will, let it happen. If it's not your will, don't let it happen. Don't let it happen. I just want to serve. I want to serve him, and I want to serve you. And whether that's opening the door, taking out the trash, or serving as a shepherd, it doesn't matter to me. I love to serve. And you love to serve. I know you do, because I've seen your hearts, and I've seen it among all of us. How does the Lord's flock thrive and survive? We can read about that in many passages. But it comes down to the basics. The basics of finding a source of food, finding water, to find protection, and sticking together. The Lord's provided all of that, thankfully. What are our responsibilities as shepherds? The job is to lead and protect at the highest level. That's at the highest level, and it gets further detailed from that, but to lead and protect. That's it. Lead and protect. We must find the Lord's greener pastures. We must lead to the Lord's righteousness to be filled. We talked about that in Matthew 5, 6 this morning. And to Jesus, the bread of life. John 6, 35, so that we will never hunger again. We must find the Lord's living waters that he was talking about to the woman on the well. In uh, John chapter 4 and verse 14, 
where we will never thirst again. That's all talking about the good things. Let's talk about protection. I assure you, if anyone comes in here to harm you, to harm anybody, to divide, we will protect. Chris seems like a nice guy, but Chris has got an intensity. I seem like a nice guy. I have an intensity. And you'll see that if that were to happen. I pray that it never does. As shepherds, we are all in. Our trust and faith is completely in God. He will provide the path that leads us to him. I am honored to serve you, and I'm honored to serve with a man with the character of Chris. We are available for you. Anytime that you have something that you're hurting and you need help in overcoming your pain, if you've got a need, if you have ideas for us to move forward in the future with the Lord's work, we want to hear from you. We want to know uh, what is going on in your life. From the highest level, our goals as a congregation is for the babes, the young people, the young couples, uh, the middle-aged, and the aged to grow. To grow closer to God. To grow closer to each other. How do we get there? It starts by being saturated with the Word of God. It's... It, that's where it begins and ends is with God and His Word and His message. And what that does is that prepares us to find our spot on the wall. To find our spot on the wall where we can work, where we can be fruitful, where we can be productive for His purposes. What is the path of hand? We don't have all the answers, but the Lord does, thankfully. We aren't perfect, but the Lord is. He will lead and bless our congregation because His will is, that, is what we all want and what we are all seeking. We will begin the process of selecting deacons pretty quickly because there's a lot of candidates that are out there and there's a lot of work to be done. And the best way to move forward and to heal and to grow together is to be immersed in the work. And that's what our plans are. What does the future look like? i tell you what I see. I see a body of Christ that is growing closer to him. I see the, us getting back to the original environment that I described. But I see an environment beyond that that's even better. Even stronger. And we're even more faithful. I see a body that comes together and that is united and God's purposes with love is our motivation. I see a body that places the Lord and His will above all else. I see a body that serves God and pleases Him, that makes Him happy because we are completely surrendered and following Him. I believe in a bright future for the church because the Lord is going to lead us. This is the Lord's day among the Lord's uh, body and the Lord's church. We've been a, given a mission from God. Let's get busy. Let's roll up our sleeves. Before I turn things over to Chris and let him say a few words, I would like to lead us in a word of prayer. Would you bow with me? Dear Lord, we want to lay aside our differences. We want to love each other despite our differing opinions. To go to our own brothers and sisters. To work through problems and restore relationships. To ask to be forgiven and to com completely forgive. To be like-minded and following you and your word. To help each other through difficult times. 
to reach out to the lost with the good news, to serve those who are suffering, to refocus and recalibrate on your mission and purpose for us. If it was only up to us, we wouldn't be able to accomplish all that we just stated. But we trust, we believe, we know that you can. You provide all good things, and we are truly thankful and grateful, especially for your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for us. Lead your people to green pastures where the living water and food are in abundance and they're available. And we know that with you and leading the way, we will never thirst or hunger again. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Pass off the mic here. Uh, I appreciate that very much, Dave. And I, um, my message is, is just going to be very short. Uh, I can say that I worked on it a whole long time, but it's not as good as Dave's. Um, but I will echo the, want to begin by echoing the, the same thing that he said to start with. We've, or we've, we've been given a tremendous responsibility. Um, and we want to say that we're very humbled by the fact that you've allowed us to to, to have this responsibility. You've put us in this uh, position and, and have trusted us with this responsibility. And I'll, I'll share a quick funny story here in a few moments that may shake your little, little bit of uh, your trust in, on my part here in a little bit, but maybe not too bad. Um, when I thought about myself as, as serving in this role, it was something that I, that I saw was far off. It was in, it was in the future. It wasn't, wasn't now. Um, but we've been talking about the eldership here at our congregation for about a year, I guess, now. And we've been studying qualifications and studying different things. And, and uh, it's really something that just in the past couple weeks, I guess you could say, or past few weeks, that I really started to, to feel a burden myself and, and, and feel like it, there was such a need for that to, to happen. I'd uh, done a study on, on what it me means to be above reproach, you know, when we look at the qualifications of eldership. And I presented a lesson on that. And, that, that study was just very impactful to me personally to see how when we look at someone being above reproach, it, it seems to always carry that, that context of, of serving and putting others first and, and being blameless in God's eyes is, is the sense that you are selfless and you, you, you put others first. And that was very uh, impactful to me. And, and just when I look at the whole uh, simple fact that that it's God's plan. You know, God, God has structured a plan for there to be leadership in each, each local congregation. And so the very fact that he's put a plan in place, uh, it, it really means that if we're not doing that, then we can't be uh, successful. We really can't be successful in anything that God has put a plan in, in place and, and we're not following. Uh, so I felt a, a big burden to, to serve and a big burden, like Dave said, to, to put your name uh, before the congregation and let them decide if they if they trust you with that. Now, getting back to the trust, I, everybody knows, I guess, that I work for, for Honda. What you may not know is that our uniforms are, are, are not very pretty. You know, they, uh, we've all heard the, the phrase that uh, a woman loves a man in uniform. Well, they weren't looking at the Honda uniform when they, when they coined that phrase. It's an all-white, long sleeve shirt, all-white, long pants. Mine has paint and stuff all over it. But I have a red and white patch that says Honda, and I have a red and white patch that says Chris. And that's the only thing that differentiates me from anybody else out there. And we all, you know, in an industrial setting, we have to wear steel-toed shoes. So I have, you know, everybody, you can look around, and you see brown and black and gray shoes. And Tuesday morning, I stepped out of my car, and I took about two steps before I realized my feet are way too comfortable. And I looked down, and at the, at the bottom of this all-white uniform are my bright blue Asics that are about this color, my, my running shoes. And I thought, well, that's not going to be real conspicuous today. But luckily, I had another pair of shoes. But the, the first thing that popped on my mind is I've got a lot on my mind right now. Didn't even put the right shoes on. So hopefully, that's not a, a sign. But we do have a, a big responsibility. And there's a lot of, lot of things that we'll have to, to, to face initially to get going and just a lot of responsibility. But again, I'm thankful for the, uh, the trust that you've given us. Um, when, our, when our family first came to Chelsea, it didn't look anything like this. Uh, I'm not sure where the, 
where, we, where the little house was in respect to where we're at now, but it was just a little house. I think maybe Brandon and Scott and some others had gutted it out, and it still wasn't very big. It was one room, and there was a little room behind it. And so when you came to meet, who, who all met in that, that little house and worshipped? Still, still several of us here. And it was, it was just, a great, just a great thing to come together because you, uh, we had 75 chairs packed in this little house. And when someone got up to speak, it was like you're standing in a living room talking, talking to your family all around because we were so packed in tight. And it wasn't just a, a feeling that Kelly and I felt. It, we, we understood that we, that we were family. Everybody exhibited that characteristic of being a, a true, true spiritual family. And that's what drew us uh, here. And our little house has just grown a little bit. We're in a, a bigger house. We have a lot more chairs, and we're a little bit spread, spread out a little bit more than we were, but we're that same family. We've, we've just grown. Um, and it's hard to think about, uh, well, it's hard not to think about our spiritual family being a family. When you look at Romans chapter 8, if you want to follow along, I'll read just a few verses, Romans chapter 8, starting in verse uh, 14. It says, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Do, do we often enough stop and consider uh, the importance of our family here at Chelsea, the importance of our family based on nothing else, if we look at it from no other perspective of, of, of who we belong to, that we're children of God? When I think about that uh, analogy of being children, I think about my own kids. You know, I think about the, the characteristics that they have, and sometimes we have fun at home with, with you know, St. Kelly will, you know, put all the bad traits on, on me, of course. Josh, he got that from you. But uh, I, I look at Grace, and she's very independent, and I can say, that, that came from me. And she likes to be on the go. I'm kind of a homebody. She gets that from, from Kelly, her ability to want to be busy and do things. Um, and, and Josh, uh, he, he's not very, well, he's, he's as opposed to Grace, who kind of is by herself, likes, can handle things on herself, Josh really appreciates the, the camaraderie of being on a team and being, being around other people. And, of course, she gets that from her mom, who, you know, likes to go out and play tennis and things with her friends. So we, we like to see the, the characteristics that we, and the traits that we get from our, from our family members. And uh, when we look at ourselves as, as children of God, uh, can we say that I, you know, when we examine our characteristics and we examine our behaviors, can we stop and say that I got that trait from my father? Uh, do, I, do we look like our, our heavenly father when we, in our words and in our actions, um, at the end of the day, can we, can we say that, that how I've lived today was because I'm a, a child of God? I, I really resembled my father in that. Um, as a parent, I ask the question, is it, is it more pleasing when you see your child uh, do something because they have to or because they, because they desire to do it? I mean, I, I think we all can answer that question. When we, when we see our kids do something good and they just do it because they want to, that's a very good feeling, isn't it? It's a very pleasing feeling to know that they, they did it that way. And again, looking at ourselves as a child of God, do our, does our character, do our words and actions that we exhibit, does it come from necessity? Um, let's look at Matthew chapter 23, verse 25, because we do... Uh, it is possible for us to, to do things a certain way on the outside, and, and Jesus oftentimes condemned the Pharisees for this. Matthew 23 uh, and verse 25. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisees first clean the inside of the cup, into the dish, so that the outside of it may become clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs on the outside, which appear beautiful, 
but inside they are full of dead men's bones and uncleanness. So it is possible for us to walk as a Christian and, and kind of check the box and say we're doing things for God, but if it really doesn't come from the heart, there's not that consistency between the, the outside and the inside. So again, when we do things, can we look at our Father and say, I, I truly did that because I, have his, because I have His heart? Are we looking like our Father? If we were, if we were separated from our children if parents were separated from our children at birth, what are, the, what are the chances that they would end up, you know, looking like the parents in character and heart? It's, it's not very good. Um, and so the only way that we as children of God can be like our Father is, is much like Dave said, to, to draw closer to Him in, word, in studying His Word and, and, and learning more about the Father, to see what kind of character He possesses, to see what kind of heart He has. Um, through reading His Word, learning more about Him, growing closer to Him, going to Him in prayer, um, and trying our best to draw near to Him so that we can look more like Him each day. And the reason that I kind of went on this direction, or this tangent, I guess you could call it, is because when, I, when we first came to Chelsea, again, that's, that's, what we, that's what we loved about it, and I think that everyone wants to come together to worship God with a, with a family. We want to worship God with uh, brothers and sisters who are truly His children because just like Paul wrote in Romans, they're being led by the Spirit. They don't, just, they don't just look like it, but they're being led by the Spirit. They truly do their best to look like the Father. And I want to worship with, with the children, with brothers and sisters, children of God who, who desire to know more about the Father, who want to do their best to, to grow closer to Him so that they can mimic His, his character and His heart. Uh, Kelly and I have already spent a good deal of time with Dave and Gina the past few weeks, and we really have grown to, to see more of their, their character and their love for God, and we've really appreciated that time together with them. And, and I think the four of us have the, the hopes of being able to spend more time individually with, with each family so that we can you know, begin a process of, of growing closer to each other. We're, we're already a, a family, but it's, you know, in coming together and seeing each other here, it's just hard to do that in, in a large group like this. So uh, I really love the small groups that we're doing, and I hope that we can continue to keep pace with that. I've really, really enjoyed ours, um, having just a smaller group to be able to look a little bit at God's Word and, and study a little bit and sit around a table and eat and play Uno with the girls over here and and just get to know our, our brothers and sisters and, and, and try to, to mold and shape each other uh, to look like our Father, to be that family that, that we want to be and helping each other to, to, to achieve that inheritance that our Father has promised us. And I think if we, just, if we keep this perspective as a family uh, simply because of who we belong to, that we are children of God, I think then God can do great, great things for us. If you're not a child of God, um, I can't think of anything more comforting to be in a family where you belong to a father that only wants the best for you. Uh, we talked a little bit, uh, bit here in the uh, class that Jared's teaching on the uh, Sermon on the Mount. And the first, first couple of, of Beatitudes start with, Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. You know, when we start out, we are, when we come to the realization that we are just spiritually empty, that we can do nothing righteous on our own, that we, don't, we can't do anything to, earn, uh, anything to earn our salvation or anything to earn the right to be called righteous or holy. That, that completely comes from God. If you realize that, if you realize that God is the only way to your salvation and you mourn, blessed are those who mourn, if you, if you understand that in your empty state... Uh, you're, you're dead. We, we talked about this morning about how that word mourn carries with it a, a deep mourning over someone who's dead. And if you come to the realization that you are bankrupt and dead without God, um, then I, again, I can't think of anything more comforting than being uh, held in the arms of a God who loves you and wants what's best for you. Again, kind of going back to that comparison of children. I can remember when Grace, being our first one, when we brought her home and seeing her just laying there in a crib, or if you're holding her and feed her, feeding her, the, the, the realization that hit me, this child is completely dependent upon me for survival. I mean, her whole existence is depending upon, depending upon 
Kelly and I to take care of her. And again, what, what more comfort is there when we know that God causes all things together to work together for the good of those that love Him and ultimately will give us the inheritance that He's promised us as children? What, what can there be that's more comforting than coming and being a child of His? If you understand that this morning and you have those feelings and you want to come uh, forward and, and have your sins that you mourn over washed away in the blood of Christ, uh, then now's the opportunity while we stand and sing.